Okay, um, so um, welcome to my Chem 1010 um, lecture, um, continuing off from last time. So last time we were talking about uh, Graham's Law, okay, which is, uh, which is the last of the gas laws that we're covering. And basically, Graham's Law covers, uh, uh, basically describes the rate uh, that, at which gas um, effuses or diffuses, um, you know, through a hole. And so, um, anyway, first let's um, look at the definitions of effusion and diffusion. Effusion is a process in which a gas escapes from a container through a small hole in the container. And diffusion is the process in which um, uh, that causes gas to spontaneously mix when they're brought together. So, anyway, you can, um, uh, here's a, uh, you know, a uh, one way to understand this, okay? So F fusion, okay, so F fusion here, so what you can see is like there's a collection of gases, and so when, ga when the gas escapes like an orifice, you know, th that's F fusion, okay? And then basically F fusion is, uh, uh, that's the rate at which um, uh, the gas uh, escapes, okay? And so in this, in this context, it's the rate at which the gas escapes through a hole like that. So that's called effusion. Okay. Diffusion is, is something different. Okay. Diffusion is the rate at which gases uh, mix. Okay. So, so let's say um, if you have a container here, Okay, and then um, and then you have like let's say that's one kind of gas. This is another kind of gas, you know. Uh, so remember the uh, kinetic uh, model of um, matter here. Basically, you know, you have molecules that move about here, and so um, uh, so uh, mix uh, the rate at which gas is mixed together. Uh, this is also there's also a name for it called spontaneous uh, mixing. Okay, so basically, so if you have uh, gases that um, <clears throat> that move about um, uh, like so, um, then they mix at a certain rate. Okay, now now, now you might ask yourself a question that is, um, what um, uh, this kind of presupposes um, a, uh, a a constant variable. Remember when we talked about uh, pressure, uh, volume, and temperature here. Um, uh, where you know you could have one variable that's constant. Uh, well, in this particular case, um, this this assumes that uh, the temperature uh, is constant. So, um, so in in the when you're calculating the rates, okay, of effusion or diffusion, you're assuming that uh, the, the there are no changes in the temperature, okay? Because uh, if there's changes in, in the temperature, uh, remember t um, like the motions of gases. Uh, like the kinetic energies of the gases, they, um, you know, they vary with temperature. And we're just assuming in this case, in the effusion and diffusion calculations, that the temperature is uh, constant. Okay, and so we're only considering the effects of, um, of uh, the masses of the different gases that govern these different rates. But anyway, so this is uh, effusion, basically means the rate at which a gas escapes through a hole. Diffusion is basically the rate at which the gases uh, mix together. Okay, so uh, so those are the two definitions, and these are governed by Graham's law. Okay, now um, one thing that um, uh, I, that uh, Graham's law here is uh, this can be uh, described in a, in an equation. Okay, so this is the equation for uh, Graham's law here. We see uh, the effusion rate or diffusion. I mean, Graham's law applies to effusion or diffusion. It, you know, it doesn't matter. It uh, it applies to both concepts. But in this case, we just have uh, effusion here. But what we see here in this formula, the rate here is is in, of gas A is here. The molecular mass of gas A is here on the on the bottom. Uh, the uh, the rate of gas B here is in the denominator, and the molecular weight. The mass here is in the numerator, and so um, so you might uh, ask, well, well, how did you figure out this relationship? Well, anyway, this is how 
um, it was figured out. And I'm just going to erase uh, my board here so I can give you an idea. So, you know, when you think about, um, you know, uh, <coughs> when you're comparing the uh, rates between two uh, different gases, and by the way, for cor for purposes of this class, we'll only um, only uh, uh, confine uh, the calculations of the effusion and diffusion rates to two uh, gases. So we're just comparing, um, you know, doing comparison between two gases. Okay, and so um, so if you think about it, uh, when uh, gases when they mix together, or um, and, and or if you want to find out the rate at which uh, gas effuses with respect to another gas here, uh, basically the kinetic energies. You know, when they come into um, e uh, equilibrium with each other, they're basically equal to each other. So, so like the kinetic energy of gas one uh, is equal to, or, or gas A is equal to the kinetic energy of gas B. Okay. So, if you uh, remember the formula for um, kinetic energy, kinetic energy here, like in physics, here is like one half uh, the mass times the velocity squared. Okay. And so, so if we think of this in terms of the velo uh, of the in, in the formula of kinetic energy, that's like saying this. Okay. Uh, M B V B squared. So that's the. Uh, uh, these, this is the kinetic energy of, of gas A, kinetic energy of gas B. So one thing that we can see here is that if we want to simplify this, the one half cancels out just like this, okay? And then, um, and then what we can do is we can rearrange this so that we can get the velocities, or the velocities is another way of describing the rate, the diffusion rate or effusion rate. So if we do that, uh, we get something that looks like this. Okay, and okay, so so that's the so uh, again what I'm doing here is basically uh, you know dividing both sides here by uh, the velo the velocity of b squared here so that's where where this comes from and and basically dividing uh, both sides here by the mass of a so basically that's like a like a like the mass there, and so um, and then what we can do here is basically uh, if we take the square root of both sides like this, okay, the square root of both sides. That's basically where you know we get this uh, form of the of Graham's the Graham's law equation like so. Okay, so that's the you can see how, this is why the rates here and and the molecular masses are are arranged like so. Okay, so so that's what we have here now. Um, so um, if we um, so let's um, uh, re, you know continue with this uh, uh, derivation here like so. So um, so if we if we take the square roots of a square, basically uh, we just have VA over VB, and then and then this uh, uh, you know remains the same. Okay. So here let me uh, let me write write this here just just like that. Just one. Okay, so um, so basically, if we uh, if we just rewrite this and then take uh, uh, so V A and then V B, so this is these are the rates here, and so this would be uh, um, excuse me, um, this is the uh, the mass of uh, of B of B here, and then this is the mass of A. Or, or in other words, this is like this, like saying the same thing as the rate of A, or the rate of B. Okay, is basically the same as, um, um, you know, the molecular weight of B, and then the molecular weight of A. Just, just like that. So. So basically, this is uh, this is Graham's law. Okay. 
and then and then this formula here applies to uh, both F fusion and diffusion. Okay. All right. So um, anyway, so let's um, let's do a problem. Okay. So here's a you know if you go back to your PowerPoint slides like so here, and um, so here's here's a sample problem here. So let's say um, so you are com let's see let's compare the um, rates of diffusion or effusion of neon and krypton gases. Okay, so how do we go about um, doing that, um, the, that problem? Well, basically, what you do is you basically just use this formula right here. Rate A, rate B equals molecular weight of B over molecular weight of A. And so, uh, so uh, what we're doing is we're comparing uh, these, uh, the, the rates of the um, uh, the diffusion and effusion rates of, of neon and uh, krypton. Okay, so what what do we know about uh, those uh, molecular weights? So what we know is um, so we know that the uh, uh, you know the, the formula weight of um, krypton is basically uh, eighty three point eight zero uh, atomic mass units. So that's formula weight of, crypt of krypton. And then the formula weight of the neon atom is basically what? Uh, 20.18 atomic mass units, J just like that. So uh, basically we can uh, just apply these um, into the formula, okay, into the uh, fusion Graham's law formula, and, and this is what we see. So, uh, so when we, let's say, so if we're looking at the rate of neon here, uh, this is, that talks about the F, either the F fusion or diffusion rates here, and you see, you see you put the molecular weight of, or the formula weight of neon here, the rate of krypton here, and the rate is there. So basically you see the units, you know, so they cancel out here. So if you do this math here, uh, you take the square root, you get uh, the square root of 4.153, or in other words, you know, if you work this out, this is 2.038. So basically, what what does that mean? So that means that if you compare the rates of neon to krypton, uh, what you'll see is that uh, you know if your if your uh, neon uh, neon fuses or diffuses about two times faster than krypton. Okay, so that's what that means. So uh, so neon to krypton, you know, so neon. Uh, a fuse or diffuse about twice, uh, uh, two times faster than krypton. Okay, and the reason for that is because um, you know uh, neon here is a is a lighter is a is a lighter um, uh, uh, atomic weight molecule. So basically, if you have a, a smaller mass, in order to uh, have the same kinetic energies, it has to travel two times faster than krypton. Okay. So, um, so in any case, this is how you would answer this question. Let's say if you're comparing uh, neon, the rate of, of neon to krypton. Now, it also means um, it also means this too. Um, now, now the way this question was worded, um, I mean that that's true. The rate of neon to krypton is about two times, you know, it's two times faster. But you can also, uh, you know, describe that as you know the rate of krypton. To the rate of um, of neon too, and then if you were to describe it that way, that would be, you know, that would be the reverse. That would simply be one or two point zero three eight. So that means, you know, the rate of krypton is about uh, half as fast as this. Okay, and, and the reason for that is because um, there's a, uh, I mean, to, like as I said, for this to have the exact same kinetic energy, uh, krypton. Um, only has to have, let's say, half that velocity as compared to neon. Okay, so th so that's how, um, you know, th that's uh, that's uh, one example of how you would use this equation. Okay, and basically you're just comparing relative rates of one gas uh, versus another, and and as I said, uh, for purposes of this class, we'll only uh, compare uh, just two two gases relative with respect to each other. Um, of course, it is possible to um, you know, to compare more gases, like three or four, but of course that gets a little bit more complicated, but uh, we won't have to uh, do that um, here. 
and so uh, so that that's the rate and then uh, so uh, yeah so, so that that's the rate okay and then one thing about um, describing uh, the rates the rates are typically um, you know uh, are, uh, the rates uh, the units uh, of um, the rates uh, could be like moles per hour. Okay, so basically that's the amount of or number of molecules per second. So, so the rate units here is basically something that uh, includes, let's say, some amount of the molecules and versus a time. So basically, this is a time, and this is um, you, you know usually a number of of molecules. Let's see. Hold a second. Number of molecules, or or number, or in this case, number of atoms. You know, you can say number of atoms. Okay. So, so usually like some number of atoms and per some unit time. So you can have number of atoms. So you can have atoms, number number of atoms per time, or or moles per hour, moles per second, moles per minute. So there there can be like various. Uh, uh, you know various uh, variations of these units, but but that's how uh, the rate here uh, is described for effusion or diffusion. Okay, so um, so uh, when I get back to uh, class um, on Wednesday, what I'll do is I'll I'll have a clicker question, and then we can just walk through uh, like a like a problem solving uh, session where uh, problem solving question where you know you'll solve a diffusion or effusion rate. So, so that's what I have for that. Okay. So th that's all I got to say about Graham's law, and that's the last. This is the last of the gas laws that we'll cover uh, for uh, the exam. All right. Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, just to recap here. So this says here that the rate of neon here um, is, uh, you know, uh, is two point. You know, if if you do the exact ratio here. Uh, that's 2.038, so that, that just says that's, that's uh, two times faster than Krypton. And uh, so, so, so that's what that means. Okay, um, the next section of, the, uh, of this chapter deals with uh, uh, like describing uh, the, the relationships between uh, the, you know, how uh, gases and liquids and solids, how uh, um, you have different uh, uh, um, well, what happens to the energies when basically you have materials that switch from a gas phase to a liquid phase to a solid phase there there are names for that okay so uh, so uh, now I have this little um, diagram here that that I, I've made up and hopefully you know it's, it's easy to understand so so when you think about uh, these processes that we talked about, like endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions, or, or endothermic processes or, or exothermic processes, um, we're, we're really talking about uh, the direction at which energy flows, okay, for, for these processes. So, so, for, so if you consider, let's say, a system of molecules, so I'm, I'm drawing these like boxes here, to represent the system of molecules. So an endothermic process, okay. Uh, let's see, what that means is that we have um, energy coming from the outside that goes into the system of molecules. So basically, this is the direction of, of heat flow. So, so if you remember the demo that I did in class where basically I had an endothermic reaction and basically the material uh, uh, got colder, it froze up. Th that's an example of an endothermic process. For an exothermic process, okay, uh, process, okay, basically heat uh, goes from the molecules into the surroundings. So that's the direction of heat flow. Okay, so so that explains why you know things get hot for an exothermic reaction. And, you know, like things like things like lighting on fire and things like that. So that's an exothermic reaction. That's an exothermic process. An endothermic process is where basically heat is taken from the surroundings in order to make the reaction go. So and so and you can think of the prefixes here. Endo means like like endoskeleton. 
the heat goes to, to the inside. Exo, exo means uh, heat flows to the outside. So, so that, that's that process. Okay. So, you know, if you think about this, um, like, uh, you know, um, and uh, like when solid becomes liquid, what happens? Um, well, basically, there's more energy that goes into the mole molecules, and there's greater thermal motion here. So, um, and so, is that an en an, ex an endothermic process or an exothermic process? If you go from the solid to a liquid, okay. Uh, actually, the answer is that that's an endothermic process because right here, you know, in order to to change something from a solid to a liquid, heat, you know, this, you know. Uh, heat must go into the system of the molecules to give it more energy and so you get more molecular motions. Okay, so that's what signify, uh, what um, disting distinguishes a liquid from a solid. A liquid has more kinetic energy. So that's what we hear, we see here. And so, and so that's, that process is called melting uh, or, or a fusion. Okay, I mean it's called both things. Okay, and, and what about if you go from a liquid to a gas, gas phase? So, so what happens there? Maybe remember, um, gases have more more kinetic energy and has more energy going into the system of molecules. So, so that is also an endothermic process here, because so if if you're thinking about this, heat basically goes into the system of the liquid molecules, and so it gets more kinetic energy, and so it goes into the gas phase like so, and so that process is called vaporization or evaporation. Okay. Now it is possible. Um, for a solid to go directly into the gas phase uh, without becoming a liquid first so th and that process is called sublimation okay and so uh, so one example of that is um, is uh, you know liquid uh, is, is dry ice you know dry ice can um, dry ice is basically uh, uh, you know dry ice here is basically uh, co2 that's a solid phase and then this goes CO2 into the gas phase. So you know you could buy this. You know, actually dry ice. You can get this from uh, Publix, you know, or, or Kroger. And then I think many of you have seen uh, sort of a sublimation effect with um, with dry ice. So anyway, here's um, actually I've got a little video here. Let's see uh, if I can right here. So this is this is an interesting video right there. So what you, what you see here is that we see uh, dry ice here in this YouTube video, and, and it turns out that the, uh, uh, you'll see these soap bubbles, okay, these soap bubbles, uh, you know, the, uh, actually uh, CO2 is much denser than, than air, so that's why the soap bubbles will tend to float up here, and then, uh, and so, you know, let's, let's start this video here. So right there, you'll see that's dry ice there. So you'll see the, you know, the bubbles, they kind of float in there because, you know, air is lighter than CO2. And then you see the sublimation here, uh, CO2 going from the solid phase directly into the gas phase. And so that's why these float in here because, uh, because uh, CO2 is denser than, than uh, air. So that's why it floats, okay. And then here's an interesting um, second demonstration coming up here. And uh, so if you, um, if you consider, let's say, a candle here, you, can, you know, when, when you uh, light it up, you know, it, it, uh, there's a reaction here uh, where there's combustion of the carbon with the oxygen, well, like so, and the oxygen's the fuel. And, you know, as you know, with fire extinguishers, fire extinguishers use a CO2 to extinguish the flame here. So, you know, what you can do here is you can uh, take up you could scoop up the CO2 right there, and then and then you can pour the CO2 and basically uh, you know uh, extinguish this flame because uh, CO2 is heavier than air. So that that's what's happening right there. That's why that flame goes out. And uh, anyway, you know if if you wanted to see that again here, this is kind of neat there. Again, you know you kind of can scoop up the uh, sublimed. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, scoop up the sublimed CO2 right there and then and then pour it out because it's heavier than the air and you know distinguishes the flame. So in any case, um, so anyway that's uh, just an interesting demo there. Okay. Now uh, now look at exothermic processes. Okay. So if you um, if you think about the reverse process, 
Um, let's say let's say if you take a gas and you want to condense it into a, a liquid, uh, which you know you can see every day. So that's called liquefaction or condensation here. And so so uh, the process where gas becomes a liquid, that's exothermic. The reason why it's exothermic is because if you consider the gas phase right here, you know it has some kinetic energy. And in order to get in the liquid phase, you have to take the heat out. So, so it has less kinetic energy and so less motion, so it becomes more liquid, you know, I mean, less kinetic energy as you'd see in a liquid. And so that's what happens here when we uh, get something in the gas phase and we um, um, take away the kinetic energy and it becomes a liquid. And then, and then also, if you go from liquid to a solid, again, it's also an exothermic process because you're taking away the heat, okay? And so, so, uh, so you can see liquid has more thermal motion here. You, you do that, and, and that becomes a solid. That's an exothermic process there. And so that's uh, freezing, called freezing or crystallization. And then and basically this, is, this uh, diagram here basically it tells you about the amount of energy. So, so basically you either gain, um, you basically uh, um, put energy into the system here, that, into the system of, of molecules, that's endothermic reactions. And if you go in the reverse direction, that is, you uh, take energy and you, you put it out in the environment, you take it out, that's an exothermic process. So, so anyway, um, so on an exam question, um, I can ask, um, okay, uh, like sublimation or, or evaporation, is that endothermic or exothermic? Uh, what about freezing? Is that endothermic or exothermic? So, so hopefully this little diagram, if you understand the concepts behind this, you, know, you can easily a answer uh, questions like that. Okay? Um, so anyway, uh, this is a, a summary of, uh, of endothermic processes, okay, so for evaporation, sublimation, or melting, or fusion, those are all endothermic processes, okay. And then also uh, for exothermic processes, you know, uh, liquefaction or condensation, um, you know, that's the, you know, process in which the um, gases condense into a liquid, that's, that's that process. Uh, freezing or crystallization, that's when the liquid becomes a solid, okay? And then also that it is possible to have a gas that um, directly, uh, you know, um, becomes a solid without going through an intermediate, um, an intermediate uh, phase, uh, an intermediate uh, liquid phase. And so, you know, that process is used for things like, uh, uh, like freeze drying. So that's how, let's say, instant coffee is made. Basically, you can, uh, uh, freeze, um, you know, create coffee crystals by directly freezing uh, from the gas phase. So that's uh, that's an example of um, of uh, the, uh, uh, of the of the deposition or condensation where gas is changed to a solid by by just freezing it very quickly. Okay. All right. Um, so. Uh, so, so that's basically, uh, you know, covers exothermic and endothermic processes. And again, the exam questions would be, okay, you know, like, a, like, like a, like a solid, like a, li like a gas phase, uh, uh, directly converting into a solid. What is that? Is that exothermic or is it endothermic? So basically, it's a, uh, a question whether you can identify uh, those processes as be, be either being endothermic or exothermic. So, um, so that that's, uh, takes care of that. Now, one thing that's um, somewhat interesting here, okay, and uh, this is um, this is characteristic of a of a of a boiling point, okay. Now, um, the boiling point. There's a definition for a boiling point. Okay. Let's uh, need to erase some of this. Now, a boiling point, okay, okay, is a um, is a temperature at a phase transition between um, uh, a liquid. And a gas. Okay, so so that's the boiling point. Okay. 
Now, one thing that we find is um, uh, that boiling points um, are um, uh, is basically uh, pressure dependent. Okay, um, so what we find is that um, you know if we uh, so so let's say let, let's let's draw this. Okay, so this is the this is liquid. Okay, and then this is the gas phase basically, and so. Uh, so what we find here is that um, you know there is a there's a temperature at which you know the liquid becomes uh, a gas. So so you know when you think about this, like the liquid, um, you know if you want to turn this into a gas, you know basically put energy into here, you'll basically put more energy into the molecules and basically it will become volatilized becomes a gas, and then that's the boiling point. Okay, so the, the boiling point is that temperature at which you get enough of this, and it becomes, you know, a gas. Now, now the thing is, the boiling point temperature varies with pressure, with external pressure. Okay, so why is that? Okay, why is that? Well, um, uh, the thing is, um, the thing is, uh, the boiling point um, is also you know, because, you know, if you're thinking about this equilibrium between the gas phase and the liquid phase, um, you know, if you think about this fairly carefully, this is where the vapor, uh, vapor pressure of the liquid, okay, is equal to the uh, atmospheric pressure, okay? So basically, you know, um, so the temperature varies, okay, um, the temperature varies depending upon uh, where the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure, okay. So, so, um, uh, so at lower pressure, okay, so, it, it, you know, if you think about this, you know, this is the, these arrows here that I'm drawing here, this is like the atmospheric pressure here. Now, at a lower pressure, uh, uh, water will boil at a lower temperature. Okay, why is that? Why, why, do, why does water boil at a lower pressure, at a lower temperature? Okay, well, well the reason is because, um, you know, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> because it takes less energy to get the molecules into the gas phase. So, so, so if you think about this, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a kinetic energy here in the liquid, so there, there's enough of that. But if this um, pressure here is reduced, it doesn't take as much energy to get this into the gas phase. Okay. And so, so that's why at lower pressure, um, at lower pressure, the boiling point is, is less. Okay. And actually, that's something that, that, we, um, that we see, okay, that we observe. Um, and um, here's a... Here, here, right here, the boiling point, the liquid here is, is, I mean, it's defined as the vapor pressure where the liquid is equal to the prevailing atmospheric pressure here, and that's where we get the phase changes. Now, if we go to, like, different parts of the world here, so, for example, uh, this is the variation of boiling point of water with elevation. So, right here, if you go to San Francisco, okay, that's sea level, water boils at 100 degrees C, okay? So, so that's, you know, what we would expect. But if you go to, let's say, a higher altitude uh, place, like, for example, Salt Lake City, Utah, you know, that's the number of feet above sea level, guess what? But water boils not at 100 degrees C, but 95.6 degrees C. So, so, so right here you see that it, it's, it, the temperature is lower. The reason is because it doesn't take as much energy uh, to get the liquid, you know, the kinetic energy of the liquid to equal the... Um, uh, the you know vapor pressure of the of the gas of the gas you know of water in the gas phase. So if we go to Colorado here, Denver, Colorado has a higher elevation here. We see the uh, boiling point temperature decrease to 95 degrees C. You know in Bolivia here 91.4 degrees C. If we go to Mount Everest here, we see that the boiling point is actually uh, 76.5 degrees C. So that, that's a huge difference. If, if you compare 100 degrees C and, and 76.5 degrees C. So basically the boiling point 
you know, you know, if we consider, like, say, the the vapor pressure of the liquid, compare that with the surrounding atmospheric pressure. Uh, the lower the atmospheric pressure, uh, the lower the boiling point uh, temperature. Okay, so um, so that that's what we observe. Okay, and um, when I have, and then I've got a here's a video, a YouTube video here that kind of uh, demonstrates this idea. So. Um, so right here, this is, uh, this is a flask here that contains some water. We can basically uh, put a pump through this and basically we can lower this, sur this uh, surrounding pressure. And what you'll see is you'll see the water uh, here start to boil. Okay? But, and the reason beca is, is because we've lowered the pressure here. So, so that's what we, um, what we can see right here. Okay? So here uh, we can basically just uh, attach this flask here with a vacuum pump and you can see that uh, you, know, you can crank on this here, and this, and then I mean, look at that. So the water's boiling here, but it's all at um, it's all at room temperature. Okay, all at room temperature, and the reason is because we basically uh, decreased the surrounding pressure right there. And and of course, this all uh, is related to the kinetic uh, theory uh, of matter. Okay, with uh, so that, that's just one of the effects of that. Okay, so anyway. So anyway, that's um, that's what that demonstration is about, and and basically that's the reason for uh, for um, why uh, the uh, boiling point temperature varies with pressure. Okay. So that's an interesting uh, pressure uh, uh, pressure temperature uh, relationship. Right here. Okay. All right. Um, now. Okay, so next, um, so this is uh, sublimation and melting here. This is, uh, you know, just a, um, you know, some other um, uh, ex, uh, like exothermic processes. This is freeze-dried coffee here that's made from that. Okay, so it's just a review. Now, um, one thing that you can do here is that uh, you can uh, measure um, the energies uh, with the phase changes of matter. Okay, and and so this is something. Uh, this is a um, uh, this is a uh, technique called calorimetry. Okay, uh, calorimetry is basically uh, the measurement of temperature of a substance. You know, as we put. Um, you know, the, the measure of heat that's put into a substance as we you know put in a known amount of energy. So let's see. Let's uh, grab this right here. Okay. So uh, so that, that's uh, energy in the state of matter. Okay. Now, okay. So in this particular case, we see this is uh, the calorimetry. Okay, calorimetry. So calorimetry. Okay. So. Um, so this is like a, a measurement here of, of heat here. So basically this is, you know, when you really translate this, this is really heat measurement. Okay. Now, now people use calorimetry uh, for one thing to be able to detect uh, phase changes. Okay. So really uh, what, what, you, what you find is that if you put it heat into uh, you know, heat into a substance and measure the temperature. Uh, so right here, you can see heat is being applied here. Uh, in this case, uh, the units is, is calorie. Calorie is a measurement of heat. Okay. So uh, calorie is basically defined as as the energy that's required to raise uh, one gram of substance by one degree. Okay. So so that's uh, that's what a calorie is. Okay. And so. Um, so, uh, so basically, people can uh, identify uh, like the presence of different phases by watching for the presence of plateaus. So, so if you heat something up, you, if you put energy into a substance here, and you you go, let's say, zero calories, ten calories, twenty calories. Well, what, what you'll find is that uh, you'll this will uh, re reach a plateau. So you have a constant temperature here for a long period of time as you're putting energy into the system. And so basically, oh, this happens to be the solid liquid um, phase boundary right there. And then, then eventually after uh, you know, so many calories here, 
uh, you'll see a, a phase change here. So you have liquid, 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 and then basically you'll see another plateau. This is a, so this is done, they, by the way, this plot here is done at the atmospheric pressure at sea level. So we know, uh, you know that f the phase changes here is 100 degrees C here at sea level. So that's what you expect for standard pressure. And, so, and that's why we also, uh, uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, when we report, uh, you know, like melting point temperatures, I mean, uh, we have to know something about the pressure. And then for all intensive purposes, you know, we uh, define a standard pressure here, like a standard pressure. Uh, is is like one atmosphere. Okay, so 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 we have to define that. Otherwise, you know, you know, boiling point temperatures will be all over the place. Okay, but so that so when we uh, have a uh, a standard uh, boiling point temperature, what we mean is that that's the boiling point temperature of one atmosphere. Okay, so that's the definition. Okay. So anyway, um, so what we see here is we see a. Um, we can see the amount of energy that's put in right here, and then we can see these plateaus, and then eventually, you know, uh, you know, we can see another phase, okay, and this is like steam right there, and so that that's actually, you know, you get water that's in the gas phase, and then if you put in enough energy, you'll get some steam uh, that forms out of there, so that so you will see, uh, you know, another um, another change in the properties here. Now. Uh, one thing is that uh, the total energy uh, that that a system of molecules can have can be calculated by basically noting the area that's underneath this curve. So, so you know, if you think about it, I mean, what uh, what has you know, if if, if you're considering like a, like something that's in the gas phase or steam, you know, something that's in the gas phase here, I mean, generally this has more uh, this has more energy because if you basically look at the integrated peak area underneath the curve there's basically a lot more area there so basically this uh, water if you heat it to a certain this has be, has a lot of energy right there and then and then as a as compared to say something that's in the liquid phase or simply or something that's completely solid there's more there's less energy um, that's uh, within the uh, within the molecules okay of water okay so um, so this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, liquid solid um, interface here this is the um, liquid gas interface here and then this is like completely uh, completely gas and so so that's why um, you know you know if you if you ha if you're asked if you were to choose between um, uh, getting uh, like like boiling water spilled over you or getting a steam burn which is worse well, what's worse a steam burn or burn uh, that's a result of boiling water you know, at least per um, uh, per amount of material. Well, the answer is that a steam burn would be worse. You know, because it would have more energy. So, like if you had if you had a steam burn here, um, you know, it would be. Uh, you know, y you basically have uh, the energy that's you know all the way here because there's a lot more energy there. Okay, if it were simply boiling water. You know, it'd be a fraction of that. You know, you wouldn't have all of this, okay? And so, so that's what the calorimetry uh, does for you. It tells you the amount of energy that um, that a system of molecules would have, okay? And then, and uh, it turns out that uh, like each substance has a, a specific heat, okay? So. Um, so water has a certain specific heat. Uh, copper or metals they have a d different s uh, specific heat, and so that um, the specific heat is uh, defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature exa of exactly one gram to, to one degree C. Okay, and so uh, so that that's also uh, you can see uh, that's why you know you have calories here, calories per degree here. This is the English system here. And this is a um, this is a table. Uh, it's also on the D2L in the content section. So you have let's say uh, various um, calories here per degree. This and this is in the SI units. This is joules per degree here. That's uh, like the system international units here. But you can see that right here, uh, different substances here will have different uh, specific heats. Okay. So so that's um, you know. And then, and then those can be used to um, 
uh, to calculate um, uh, you know how much um, energy is is used um, like let's say if you were to uh, take a certain mass of something and and let's say if you were to um, rate if you were to raise the temperature of it by so much amount how much energy did you put into that okay so um, so that's um, that's how you can calculate the amount of heat uh, that you can put into various substances and they have uh, different specific heats okay uh, so the units here are uh, calories per uh, mass and degree okay All right so um, so uh, and then there's a formula com convenient formula that will help you um, calculate the specific heat so um, this is what I have here so uh, the heat, the heat that you put, um, uh, the heat that you, uh, that's, uh, that you, that can be released or absorbed, okay, depending upon whether you're talking about an exothermic process or an endothermic process, is basically uh, the mass of the material times the specific heat, okay, times the change in the temperature. So the change in the temperature uh, uh, tells you how much, uh, you know, gives you an idea how much energy is put into the system or taken out of the system here. And the mass of the material, that, you know, that's just the mass in grams. And the specific heat is basically uh, based on this table here. And in order to solve, you know, these types of calorimetry questions, I have to give you what the specific heat is. Okay, so otherwise you won't be able to do the problem. Okay. So, um, so anyway, um, so that's the formula that you would use here. And then, and if you think about it, you know, if you if you think about the units here and the amount of heat here that's used, I mean, this is somewhat uh, of an easy formula to remember because, like, if you have grams here and you have specific heat, is usually you know, let, let's just say calories, okay, per gram per per degree. Okay, and then the reason why I put degrees is that the degrees could either be in Kelvin or Celsius, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the magnitude of the change in within one degree Celsius is the same as um, the change in one degree Kelvin. Because really, Kelvin and Celsius uh, is just offset by 273, 273 degrees. So, uh, so it doesn't matter that we're talking about Celsius or, or, or Kelvin. Uh, and, uh, in Fahrenheit, you'd have to use a more complicated uh, uh, um, formula to convert. Uh, so you'd have to convert into Celsius or Kelvin. But, but if you're talking about things between Kelvin and Celsius, that's an easy conversion. Say a change in degree in temperature in Celsius is the same as the change in temperature in Kelvin. So, so if you look at this here, so if if if, if you're looking at the if you're doing a unit analysis here, you'll see that uh, if you take mass here, the mass will cancel like so. And degrees here, you know whether Kelvin or Celsius, they'll, that will cancel. So, um, so the heat here is, is in calories, and so that makes sense. Okay, and actually that gives you that that's an easy way to remember um, this formula right here. Okay, so um, so let's let's look at this example problem. Okay, so here's an example problem here. Uh, calculate the heat uh, released. Okay when uh, five kilograms of steam at 100 degrees C condenses to water at 100 degrees in a radiator of a steam uh, heating system. Okay, so, so you have a steam heating system and you have five kilograms of steam and then if it condenses into water, I mean, how much heat um, is released uh, as a result? Okay, so, so anyway, uh, you just you can just use this formula right here, okay? So we can, uh, we can well let's do this question, okay? So um, so it's very easy to uh, do here. So you have 5.0 kilograms, okay? And then you'll need the specific heat, okay? And then the uh, temperature here, it, right here. So you're looking at 120 degrees and then 100 degrees here. So the delta T here, okay, is basically just the temperature difference. So if you're comparing, let's say, 100 degrees minus 100, 100 degrees, so that's that's a difference in uh, that that's that difference is like 20 degrees, okay. 
So, so we see that this is 20 degrees, okay? And then, so the only thing that you need here to solve for this is the specific heat of the, uh, of the uh, steam, okay? Now, if you look at the uh, table, okay, um, table D2L, this is a steam here, okay, so uh, which, which, which of these specific heats are, are relevant here? So you have water in the solid phase, water in the liquid phase, water in the gas phase. Notice here that uh, if you're looking at water, if you have uh, different phases here, uh, you'll have different, um, you know, you'll have different specific heats. So if you're looking at steam, uh, water here, okay, so that's basically, you know, if you want to look at this in, in calories per gram per degree, uh, you want to use this number right here, so point, uh, 0 0.48. So, so when you're doing this calculation here, um, you know, you cal, uh, kil, uh, so you'll, you'll notice that this is 5.0 kilo, kilo, kilograms, and then this is 0 0.48 um, uh, calories here per um, uh, gram per degree, okay, times 20 degrees, okay. Now, now one thing here, you notice here, I mean, kilo, you got kilograms here, you got grams here, I mean, this won't cancel. In order, for, in order to get this to cancel, you know, this has to be in the proper units. So 5.0 kilograms, let's just change that to uh, 5,000 grams, okay? Because that, that's what it is, 5,000 grams, okay? So kilograms, remember, kilo is like 10 to, the, 10 to the third power, grams, that's what it is. So now we can get, basically get this to cancel like so. We get this to cancel like so, so our answer will make sense because the units will be in calories here, and so the answer here is uh, would be uh, uh, forty-eight thousand uh, calories here. Okay, or or in other words, uh, forty-eight. Uh, you can say forty-eight kilocalories. You know? So again, that's just using the SI unit right there. So so that that's the answer to that question. You know, in terms of um, Determining, um, let's see, where's uh, uh, calculating the heat that's released from that. Okay, so so that's how so that that's how that problem uh, is done. Okay. Now, um, w w one thing I would uh, want to tell you about here, I think it's probably best that I that I um, explain this in class in person because uh, this question, this next question. Um, is a, is a kind of complicated here, okay? So um, and um, so uh, this has to do with um, homework number eleven, uh, question sixteen. Basically, you know, if you know, if you come to class, um, you know, on Wednesday when I get back, I'll, I'll basically tell you know sh tell you how to do that question. But you know, it's a little bit complicated for that, and and I think. Uh, I think I'll just save that, you know, until like when I come back uh, for class, and uh, because um, they, and and uh, I've decided that um, this type of question I will not include on the on on exam three, not on exam three. But I'll explain how to do it, and you can get homework points for that. So at least at least uh, you know the question where I mean the question involves. Um, um, uh, the, the question involves uh, uh, changing, let's say, five, you know, suppose you had 500 grams of ice here, and then, and then, uh, and then if you want, if you compare it to, let's say, temperatures of minus uh, 10 degrees C to um, 120 degrees C, uh, there's a huge uh, energy change, and how do you calculate that? And, and, and as I said, you know, I think, um, I think that you know I've decided uh, you know all the steps involved to, to answer this question. Um, you know, I decided not to put that on exam three, but at least you know you'll get homework points uh, for that. Okay, so so I'll talk about that when I uh, get back uh, to class. Okay, so um, so with that uh, that basically uh, concludes um, like the material that I wanted to show for um, for chapter five and. Um, and so what we'll, you know, what I'll do is like I'm going to come back and I'm going to when I, when I get back on Wednesday, I will uh, just revisit a couple of concepts that I've I've mentioned in this video here, 
and and then we'll uh, begin with uh, th then then the next part here. Um, you know, again, you know, I'll just uh, uh, reiterate some uh, points here with uh, the heat of fusion vaporization, heat of vaporization. Actually, I, I've told you how uh, those are, are calculated here, and um, so um, uh, those are, are calculated here, and. Uh, and the next and the following uh, chapter will be on solutions and then you know if you look at the uh, at the uh, checklist on D2L for exam 3 uh, basically those are just some definitions and so I will I will go over some definitions uh, with solutions and uh, and again we'll re revisit some things with homogeneous mixtures and and and, and the components uh, that are involved in making up solutions when I talk about that so the definitions are relatively easy you know they're not that hard to understand and then and then uh, we'll be done with uh, all material with material for exam three at least that's my plan for Wednesday and then uh, basically uh, material after that will be on the uh, mandatory part on the final exam and uh, so so that that's coming up uh, soon too okay so we'll uh, see you on uh, Wednesday